Okay, so back in March of this year, I matched with this cute looking guy on Bumble, and after a week or two of texting back and forth, we arranged to meet up someplace. At first, he wanted to keep the place he had in mind as a surprise, but I don't do surprises on first dates. So after squeezing him for info, he told me that his plan was Icon Park. For those of you that don't know, Icon Park is like a mall slash amusement park here in Orlando, kind of like a Disney World for grown-ups. And although an amusement park wasn't my idea of a perfect date, I figured it was a good place as any to meet someone for the first time. Nice and public, lots of cameras, you get the idea. I broke it to him gently that I wouldn't be interested in going on any rides, but he was cool with just meeting up for ice cream and keeping it chill, so it was a date. It actually started off as a really nice date. I got some pistachio ice cream, he paid, we talked movies and music, it was a good time. After that, we started walking around the park, just chatting about this and that, until we came to the Orlando Freefall. The Freefall is one of the big, tall tower rides, the kind where everyone is strapped into a ring which goes up real high, then plummets down super fast before slowing and stopping near the bottom. I'm sure you all know the kind I'm talking about. As someone with a distinct fear of heights, the free fall is my idea of hell. And of all the rides they have at Icon, the free fall is one that I'd rather die before riding. I remember feeling nauseous from just looking at it, so much so that my date started laughing to himself and jokingly asking me if I wanted to ride it. Obviously, I told him no, then as we're staring at the free fall, we start talking about how I'm not into roller coasters and how I'm actually kind of a homebody which makes dating pretty tiresome for me sometimes and stuff like that. But the whole time, I have my eyes pretty much glued to the freefall in some horrified trance, watching as each drop preceded the sound of screams from all the people riding it. It repeats the cycle one more time, edging up towards the top before suddenly dropping again. Only that time, the screams from the freefall sounded different, and I suddenly noticed someone falling through the air. I remember how feeling it caused this pressure in my stomach, this pure gut punch reaction of not being able to do anything about what I was seeing. My actual lifelong nightmare of falling off of a roller coaster had come to life, right there in front of me, and even having seen it with my own eyes, I didn't want to accept it. A collective scream of absolute horror rose up from the crowd surrounding the free fall, one I don't think I'll ever forget as long as I live. And when my date asked me, in this stunned and trembling voice, if someone fell off the ride, I told him that I hoped not. I always think about my choice of words in that moment, how I opted to use the word hope over everything else I could have said. I knew what I'd seen. I saw the person's limbs flailing in terror as they fell. I just couldn't quite bring myself to accept it. In the moments after the screams... A few people began running in the direction of the free fall, but way more people started walking or running away from it. Some of them were pale, others were crying. One guy was just walking away with his fingers clasped around the back of his head, saying, what the F, what the F, over and over again. I realized that they were people that had all seen what I'd seen, only it was more real to them because they'd seen it up close. Instead of just watching someone fall like I had, they actually watched someone die. When it really hit me, when I finally came out of that paralyzed state of belief, all I could do was just walk in the opposite direction. I had to just get the image of that metal tower out of my head, and as my date started to follow me, asking if I was okay, I had to really fight not to just burst into tears right there and then. I still remember how all these different kinds of thoughts seemed to be wrestling for control of my mind, this mix of wondering how the person got loose from their seat, wondering if it hurt, wondering if they were okay. But there was no way they were okay. They must have fallen at least a hundred feet down onto solid concrete. It'd be a miracle if a person survived a fall like that. In the end, the thing that had my eyes welling up with tears was thinking about how the person's mom would take the news. You'd never really know when a person's time is up and the thought of the person and their mom maybe having a fight or just some other bad interaction, not knowing it would be the last time they'd ever see each other, just that idea alone made me break down. Even now, just typing it out makes my lips quiver. The idea that 
you can just hit up an amusement park one day, then boom, next thing you're dead. I know this is all making me sound a bit selfish, talking about my own reaction to it instead of describing how I helped in some way, but me and my date were at least a football field away from the free fall, and tons of other folks were closer and were already calling 911. That feeling of being useless again, of not being able to stop it or turn back the clock or help in any way at all, it was one of the worst feelings I'd ever felt in my whole life. I asked my date to take me home, and those words were the only thing I could actually say outside of just sitting there crying. He was great in that respect. He just put his arm around me, walked me all the way back to his car, and took me straight to my apartment. He offered to come inside and stay with me if I didn't want to be alone, but I told him it was okay, that I just needed to be away from people so I could process what I'd just seen. He was real shaken up too, and I feel bad that I had said no to him, as he might have needed someone around just to keep from focusing on it. But I just couldn't do anything but just curl up on my bed and cry. Days went by, and I barely talked to anyone except my mom, my sister, and the guy I'd been on a date with. My mom and sister were great. They brought me care packages, made sure that I was okay for money and stuff because I was way too traumatized to go to my waitressing job. But I think my date for that day helped the most because he could actually understand what I'd seen and how I was feeling. He also kept up to date with the news surrounding what had happened, and that's how I found out exactly what had happened with the free fall accident. And forgive me if any of this is wrong because I only skimmed the article and this is all from memory, but the 14-year-old kid who tragically lost his life was well over the weight limit for the ride. There were some seats that had been adjusted to accommodate larger riders, so the kid was seated in those. But then whoever was in charge of strapping them in didn't do it properly. So after the straps got loosened, after a few reps, the free fall dropped. But the kid just slipped out of his seat, fell at least a hundred feet, then died instantly when they hit the concrete. I feel horrible for the kid's family. I still do. And please don't let what I'm about to say detract from the sympathy I have for everyone involved, but knowing something was wrong helped me get past the trauma. I'm probably not going to articulate this very well, so I'm sorry if this is confusing or doesn't make any sense, and I probably just sound dumb admitting that the whole thing got me so depressed when it barely affected me, but here it goes. Knowing the kid's death was down to human negligence in some way made me realize that it wasn't just random. It wasn't some skinny kid who'd slipped out of the seat after having conformed to the minimum height and weight requirements. The person who died should have never been allowed on that ride to begin with. Something went wrong, not just with the ride, but with the safety procedures. I'm guessing the kid's family are going to sue the park, and so they should, because if the park had just played it safe and kept the height and weight recommendations, their kid would still be alive. That's what I kept telling myself anyways, and over time, the trauma turned to an anger towards Icon Park and the freefall itself. I honestly hope the family gets millions out of the park owners, and I honestly don't care if the whole place gets shut down or whatever, because if you're willing to risk a life just for a few bucks, you don't deserve to own any kind of business, let alone an amusement park. Many years ago, way back when I was a sophomore in college, I had a summer job as a lifeguard at a water park. It was a pretty cool job in a lot of ways, a great place to talk to girls, and if you worked a shift longer than seven hours, you could get a free cheeseburger on your break. So, this one day, it was like a hundred degrees outside, not a single cloud in the sky, and I'm sweating balls because I had to wear khakis and a thick polo shirt as part of my uniform. The most that me and the rest of my lifeguards could get was a water bottle refill every hour. It was like that all week too. But this day in question was way worse for me because when the boss was neglecting jobs at the start of the day, he decided to give me the highest water slide in the park. The thing was about 60 feet high and had three channeled slides that started off like a pipe and then became fluted channels, which means the slide becomes a half pipe with no ceiling. One pipe, and the one that was the most popular, went down at like a 140 degree angle. It was really steep, 
I mean, people just flew down that thing in about two or three seconds. I can confirm it was an awesome water slide, so it made sense that it was so popular. But then that popularity meant that we needed to seriously police folks using it. So one lifeguard was posted at the top of the slide, then one was posted at the bottom to minimize any chaos and avoid accidents. So by about midday, I'd settled into the rhythm of allowing four people a minute to head down the water slide, one every 15 seconds, just like clockwork. Then up comes what is clearly a group of male teenage friends and they all seemed way too excitable for my liking. Teenage boys are the like of the king trolls of the park, and their antics are an almost constant source of problems for all members of the park staff, from the lowliest trash haulers to the higher levels of management. I can see these kids have mischief in mind. I just don't know what exactly they're planning. But regardless, I make it clear to them that I don't want any trouble, and they all need to chill before I allow them to head down the slide. They seem to calm down at first, and the first three go down the slide as requested. But then the fourth, just before he heads down the slide, turns to give me this grin when I give him the go-ahead. He then grabs hold of the top of the pipe, jumps up into the air a little, then basically flings himself down the pipe way faster than was safely allowed. I tried to grab him at the last second just to slow him down a little, but I guess the heat got to me that day because my reaction was way too late to make a difference. He just bombs down the slide, and I look over the side of the tower to the section that's only a half pipe. Seconds later, I see exactly why us lifeguards were told never to let anyone throw themselves down the slides like that. Now, at that point in my life, I'd been scared of a bunch of different stuff. I feared flunking out of school, getting rejected by girls, having my parents get divorced, but nothing in all my life has made me this scared until now. As the kid hit the half-pipe section of the slide, he comes in real fast at a side angle and the momentum basically throws him up out of the pipe, then down maybe 30 or 40 feet onto the concrete below. Seeing a young man fall to his impending doom and being powerless over it makes you feel terrible. Feeling, by some extension of logic, that you are indirectly responsible for this makes it even worse. And never, in all my life, has my stomach and jaw dropped so fast. I felt literally sick with fear, and the sound the kid made when he hit the concrete was somehow even worse than I imagined. He landed with this huge smacking sound, and because he didn't move, I actually thought the kid was dead at first. Two seconds later, even though his scream sounded worse than anything I'd ever heard, I was weirdly relieved knowing that he hadn't been killed outright. But that didn't mean his injuries weren't absolutely devastating. When the paramedics came to cart the guy away, I saw how floppy his arm was. He'd landed on that side and the force must have just crushed his whole arm because when they put him on the stretcher, it was flopping around like a piece of wet spaghetti. It was basically just chaos all around the kid as he was lying there. Other kids were crying, even some older folks were covering their faces and shaking having to be consoled by their loved ones. We all just thought that we'd watch this kid die, so imagine all the painful reactions a person would have to seeing that, and I can promise you that they were all on display down below me. But for me, once I saw that he was okay, relatively okay anyway, all I felt was anger. I'd warned all four of those teenagers not to pull anything stupid, and the way the last one sort of gave me this screw you look before he threw himself down the slide it all just made me furious. Sure, he was hurt, really bad too, but if he'd only listened to what I had to say, it all could have been avoided. I thought I was going to get fired, but luckily for me, the park manager understood the situation and refused to write me up or caution me, so I got to keep my job that summer. There were no more accidents on our biggest slide either because it was closed off for the rest of the summer. I heard it opened up the following year with a cover on the lower half of the slide, and that was good to hear, knowing that kind of accident couldn't happen again, but I felt even better knowing that no other lifeguards were going to have to go through the same fear and terror that I had.
I grew up in this little place called Pruitt in northern Arkansas. Growing up, all my friends lived down in Jasper, so if I wanted to see them, my mom or dad used to drive me down there for playdates. When I was old enough, I'd ride my bicycle down there, but our bikes also gave us the freedom to explore for miles and miles in every direction. And that's how we rediscovered Dog Patch. Dog Patch is this abandoned amusement park up in a place called Marble Falls. It closed sometime when I was a kid, and I remember visiting when it was still in business, but we just kind of forgot about it over time until we rediscovered it one day while out riding our bikes. It definitely wasn't your typical amusement park. There were no roller coasters or anything like that, and I think the owners were going for a more wilderness camp kind of feel to the whole thing. I remember there being a big water slide, which wasn't so wet when we started hanging out there. A bunch of abandoned log cabins with these big red brick chimneys. It definitely wasn't a safe place to be hanging out, but I think that just made us want to hang out there all the more. And that we did, for almost four years, and each summer Mother Nature claimed more and more of the park until it was as wild as we were. I spent some of the best days of my childhood in that old abandoned theme park, but for reasons that'll become obvious, those memories are all tainted for me now. I know that's something I need to work through, but it's difficult to prevent what I'm about to tell you from bleeding through. Like I said, I spend most of the happiest times of my teenage years at the dog patch, but I also endured the worst few moments of my entire life there too. The third summer we spent hanging out on the dog patch marked a big change for me and my buddies, and it was one I'd never have expected. In Pruitt, there was a family that had a real bad reputation. They were real poor, so I guess it wasn't their fault in a lot of ways but they for sure seemed like they were crazy mean to their kid Noah. Noah was real weird too. I remember one time in middle school all the kids started pointing and laughing at him because he was eating cat food for lunch. You'd think that'd shame him into throwing it away or at least trying to hide it or something, but Noah didn't seem to care. Either he was so hungry that he didn't care if people were laughing or he just couldn't hear it. There were a bunch of wild rumors flying around about his family too some saying that they were all on drugs, some saying that they were serial killers or kid snatchers. Even my parents told me to stay away from their place, and that he didn't even have a bad word to say about anyone. Noah was a real loner, and we didn't figure that was by choice either. He didn't hang out anywhere we knew of, we didn't know of him having any friends, and we never saw him outside of school. So imagine our surprise one day when we sneak onto the dog patch to find that we have ourselves some company. Someone was just sitting on the edge of the little pit where the old water slide was supposed to splash down and as we got closer, we realized it was Noah. We didn't approach him right away. The four of us just huddled together then wondered aloud what he was doing and how he'd gotten in. Seeing Noah out in the wild like that was like seeing Bigfoot or something and while we didn't exactly want to chase him off of our territory, we weren't too keen on hanging out with him either, or even approaching him. At least until we pulled something out of his pocket, put it between his lips, then set it alight. It was a cigarette. Now I know some of you that might not seem like a big deal, but to us, it was no small thing. We were all pretty much freshly 14 at that time, and where we lived is still very, very conservative, so the idea of anyone our age smoking or drinking was pretty wild. I think Noah knew we were staring. Maybe that's why he lit up in the first place to get a reaction out of us. Either way, it worked. One of my buddies steps forward and then calls over to Noah asking if it really was a cigarette. That's the kind of state of disbelief we were in. That and Noah was definitely weird enough for us to think he was just pretending to smoke with a piece of rolled up newspaper or something. Noah then invited us to come over and see for ourselves. Then lo and behold, he is actually smoking a cigarette. That wasn't even the craziest thing though, because when we asked where he got it, he pulls out a whole unopened pack, then tells us that his grandma bought them for him. We immediately called bullcrap on that, but Noah says he can prove it by bringing us all an open pack of cigarettes the next day. We obviously didn't believe him, but then the next day, he showed up with a whole bunch of smokes, along with a little flask of whiskey for us to try. We still didn't believe that he was just getting the stuff off of his grandma. We were convinced that he was stealing it from somewhere. But 
As time went on, we started actually believing him. Slowly but surely, over the course of a few weeks, Noah started to ingratiate himself into our little group. Noah, it turned out, was an okay guy. He definitely warranted his reputation for being weird, and he definitely smelled a little funky. But if you kept your distance and accommodated his weird sense of humor, Noah was actually a pretty fun person to hang out with. We even brought up that whole cat food incident in middle school. Noah just laughed it off, saying it was all just to provoke a reaction, before adding that cat food actually wasn't all that bad if you ignored the smell. I honestly couldn't tell if he was serious or not, but I honestly didn't care. Noah was our ticket to a whole world of forbidden excitement that summer. Booze, smokes, adult magazines. Noah seemed to be able to get his hands on just about anything for us. For a long time, we just didn't question it. I mean, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, right? But then the time finally came when curiosity outweighed our apathy and we started probing. The moment coincided with Noah bringing along some old copy of Hustler, then as he was flicking through the pages, one of us finally asked if it really was his grandma who was getting all this stuff for him. Noah insisted on it, like it was the most normal thing in the world, and that's about the same time we found out that he didn't actually live with his parents, but rather with his grandma in some run-down old trailer. That didn't exactly take us by surprise, but... What we all really wanted to know by that point was, why did his grandma buy him booze and smokes, or more accurately, why didn't she see anything wrong with it? I didn't know what kind of answer I expected, but at the minimum I expected a straight one, so it was deeply unsatisfying to hear Noah say something like, she buys me stuff when I'm good. Take it from me, Noah must have been very well behaved around his grandma because he brought stuff with him almost every day. But aside from the moral question, the other thing we did understand was how his grandma was able to afford all that stuff. From what we could gather, his grandma was at home most of the time, so she didn't seem to have a job. Noah said different guys came over a couple of times a week to give her money, but other than that, he had no idea where she got all of her cash from. I remember my buddies giving each other looks as if to say, this is the luckiest guy in the universe, but didn't share their thoughts. Instead, I noticed something come over Noah, and afterwards, he went real quiet for a while. I remember how a thought occurred to me while we were all still hanging out. It was related to Noah's grandma, and given the nature of it, I didn't bring it up right there in front of him. But then, on the ride back south, I told my buddies I thought I knew where Noah's grandma was getting her money. When I told them, they all just laughed at first, thinking I was making a joke or something. But when I told them I thought that Noah's grandma might be a working girl, I was deadly serious. It explained why he was so neglected, why his grandma had so many different guys coming over to give her money. It didn't quite explain why she was buying Noah whiskey and cigarettes, but it explained a lot of other stuff. It couldn't have been a drugs thing, at least we didn't think so. We'd already asked if Noah could get his hands on something stronger than booze, and he told us that that was the one thing his grandma wouldn't allow. Seemed like a weird place to draw the line, but I suppose it had to land somewhere. We did a lot of speculating that summer, but it was all basically pointless. None of us was going to actually ask if Noah's grandma was a hooker because we didn't want to upset or annoy him or lose our golden ticket in the process. So, for a while, that was that. Even though we really wanted to know, we just told ourselves that Noah's family stuff was none of our business and for a while anyway... It stayed that way, all up until the night when Noah made it my business. I remember the night mom and dad had such a big fight that I thought it might get physical. They were screaming at each other, slamming doors closed, throwing things around, and they were like that for hours. In the end, I just couldn't listen to it anymore. I remember how warm and humid the summer night seemed as I walked out the front door and closed it behind me, quiet too, so mom and dad wouldn't notice. Then I hopped on my bike and rode all the way up to the dog patch, the one place I felt like I wouldn't hear my parents yelling in my head. I rode the 20 minutes or so up to the dog patch, found the secret little entry point that we'd made by pulling away a few rotten fencing boards, then climbed through into the abandoned park. I start walking across this big field that had the old water slide on the other side of it, and as I get closer, 
I see this little orange light glow real bright in the darkness for a second before fading back down again. It was a cigarette. Someone was smoking a cigarette near the old water slide, and I found myself praying that it was just Noah and not some psycho killer about to run me down to my doom. I called out to the person through the darkness, asking if it was Noah, and to my relief, they called back, Yeah. It was Noah's voice all right, but there was something else in there, something shaky and nasal like he'd been crying. I walked over to the little concrete pit and sat opposite him, then heard the telltale sniffles of someone who'd been shedding a tear or two. I saw Noah had a cigarette in one hand and a bottle of something in the other. I didn't see what it was at his feet. I asked him if he was okay. Noah didn't reply. He just took a sip from the bottle, grimaced, then took another drag on the cigarette that he was smoking. Bearing in mind, since Noah was held back a year, he was only 15 years old at the time, but I swear he held that bottle like a man who'd lived three or four times as long. He wouldn't say what was wrong, but I knew that there was something, so I tried to do at least the bare minimum of a friend and tell him something reassuring. I'll always remember saying, it'll be okay, whatever it is, it'll all be okay one day. I don't remember those words for their mediocrity, but because of what Noah said in response, or more importantly, how he said it. In reply to me telling him everything would be fine, Noah just replied, no, it's not. I wanted to tell myself that he was just being cynical, but there was something in the way he told me, no, that gave me chills. He sounded resigned, doomed even. I tried telling him about how my parents were fighting, how it upset me so bad that I rode out there, but I also told him that no matter how bad they fought sometimes, they'd always get sweet on each other again after a while. He just had to ride it out. But again, his dismissal sounded like that of a condemned man. I tried more talking, anything to get him to feel better, but in the end, Noah just told me to shut up and smoke a cigarette with him in peace. He shuffled up off the concrete for a second so he could slide his hand into the pocket of his jeans, and then after he took out a pack of cigarettes, he passed one over along with the lighter. I remember putting the butt in my mouth, but it wasn't until I ignited the lighter that I saw it had blood on it. I let it fall from my lips in shock, only to hear Noah say, Sorry, want another? I declined and flicked the lighter on again before leaning down to make sure that I wasn't mistaken. There was the cigarette lying on the floor with something that looked a lot like bloody fingerprints on the white paper. But I noticed something else while I was down there, the thing that had been lying at Noah's feet. It was a gun. I remember asking, is that a gun? But to this day, I don't know why. Maybe it was a gut reaction or kind of like wishful thinking or something. I asked because I wanted him to tell me no, but he couldn't, because it was a gun that had been lying at Noah's feet. When I asked him, he leaned over to pick it up, and I swear that I felt my skin trying to crawl right off of my body. I'd been around guns before, even fired one a few times, and I'd never been around anyone with a gun who was drunk and emotionally distressed before. The feeling must have caused some kind of slight but definite physical reaction in me, because Noah started to reassure me that the gun wasn't loaded, and that I had nothing to be afraid of. I asked him what he was doing with an unloaded gun, and he just replies, It wasn't loaded when I picked it up. I remember the horrified feeling of realizing Noah had shot somebody, but also this horrible, all-consuming curiosity for who it was that he'd shot. So after a considerable silence, I finally brought myself to ask him who it had been. He just sighed, then asked me if I remembered what he'd said about men coming over every few days to give his grandma money. I told him I did, then asked if it was one of those guys that he'd shot. Noah just nodded, but then told me that's not why he felt bad. Now, keep in mind, I'm still under the impression that Noah's grandma is some kind of escort or that at least something weird is going on. I'm thinking some guy came over, started beating on his grandma, then Noah snapped and just blew the guy away. 
I immediately understood why doing something like that wouldn't leave a person feeling too bad, but Noah was still real shaken up by something, in which case, something must have happened to his grandma. It took me a moment or two to figure that out, but when I did, I asked him if the guy he shot was hurting his grandma. I was so sure the answer was going to be yes that for a second, I wondered why I'd asked the question in the first place. But Noah didn't say yes. In fact, he shook his head before covering his face with his hands. Then the only words I could make out before he burst into tears again was, I shot my grandma. I couldn't believe what I just heard, and I had to wait until Noah's sobs died down before I asked him if he was serious. There was no way that he could have shot his grandma. There was just no way. I don't think Noah respected her as much as others might respect their grandparents, but he didn't hate her. At least it didn't seem that way to us. To me, at the time, the only way it could have happened was if the guy was beating on Noah's grandma and he accidentally shot her. And that's what I went with. And I told him the cops would go easy on him if it was an accident, especially if he was trying to protect her. And that's when he told me it wasn't an accident. I was so stunned that all I could do was sit back down on the edge of the concrete pit. I wanted to ask why, but it was like I'd run out of the woods by that point. I didn't say anything, but it was like Noah heard my thoughts because about a minute or so into the silence that followed, he says five little words that have haunted me well into my adult life. He said, She let them do it. I still didn't quite know what to say, and I was still reeling from the news that shooting his own grandma hadn't been an accident, so I didn't really focus on what he said about her letting them do it, whatever that meant. After that, Noah put the bottle down next to himself on the concrete edge of the pit and tossed the pack of cigarettes at me. Then he got up and started walking off back towards the makeshift entry we had going. There was a moment where I was going to ask him if he needed help, but if what he said was true, he was way beyond any help I could offer him. But what I did ask was why he wasn't taking his smokes with him. I don't need them anymore, was all he said. Then he disappeared into the darkness. Sometime later, I arrived back home and my parents were furious that I'd sneaked out so late. They weren't so mad after I told them what Noah had told me. They were too busy getting in touch with the police and, for me, that was the start of a huge scandal that engulfed the whole area for weeks. I don't know what became of Noah. The cops never found him. But the general consensus was that he was just a bad kid who'd stolen his grandma's whiskey, then shot her and her boyfriend. I hadn't put the whole thing together at that point, so that was what I believed too. Years later, and I'm talking well into my college years, I happened to be drinking the same kind of whiskey that Noah had brought for us. All those years earlier on that second day that we hung out together. Then as I was sipping it, his words flashed through my mind again. She let them do it. Noah's grandma wasn't making money by selling her body. She was making money by selling his. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. On the morning of September 26, 2011, construction workers arrived at the site of a former cement factory just north of St. Louis, Missouri. For many of them, the project they were faced with was the most unusual of their entire careers, as they were tasked with creating a very unconventional kind of amusement park, one simply named Cementland. Cementland was the brainchild of a man named Bob Casilli, an eccentric but highly successful entrepreneur who played a central role in the revitalization of downtown St. Louis. He envisioned Cementland as a kind of brutalist art installation turned amusement park, one which would feature giant concrete sculptures, the rusting skeletons of obsolete machinery, and even an artificial river large enough to accommodate small boats. 
Kasili proved to be an exacting taskmaster, but had earned the respect of the construction crews by pouring his own blood, sweat, and tears into the project. He sometimes slept overnight on the unfinished job site, and after long days of backbreaking work, Bob would carry on working long after the construction crews put down their tools. So, on the morning of September 26th, when the construction crews spotted Bob's truck and an unlocked job site, they simply assumed that he'd started work early that day. Yet as they walked onto the site, they were greeted by a dead silence that hung thick in the air. Construction work is nothing but noise, and to hear a silent job site is as rare as it is disconcerting. So, after clocking in and filling up their coffee flasks, the construction workers fanned out over the job site to search for Bob Casilli. After just a few minutes of searching, one of the workers cried out in alarm and, after rushing to his location, the remaining construction workers were greeted by a horrifying sight. One of the site's bulldozers was lying on its side at the bottom of a steep slope, and lying slumped over in its cab, covered in blood, was Bob Casilli. The workers immediately contacted 911, but sadly, EMTs discovered that Bob had passed away as a result of his injuries just a few hours earlier. Attending police officers initially believed that Bob had died as a result of an accident, one that involved his bulldozer rolling down the steep hill on which he'd been working, crushing all his ribs and causing severe head trauma in the process. But although St. Louis Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Michael Graham confirmed this cause of death in his autopsy report, he couldn't be certain that Bob had actually been in the cab of the bulldozer when it had tumbled down the hill. Officially speaking, the police ruled Bob's death an accident, but over the weeks that followed, Bob's widow began to insist that her husband was murdered, and that his death had been staged to appear accidental. This theory was supported by a physician, Dr. Arthur Combs, who asserted that Bob's injuries were far too severe to have resulted from a mere accident. In his expert opinion, only a sustained and vicious attack with a blunt object could have caused such mortal wounds. Spurred on by the doctor's professional opinion, Giovanna Casilli began conducting her own investigation into her husband's death, and in the process, discovered something deeply disturbing. She once cited an article from St. Louis's Riverfront Times which stated that fatal bulldozer rollovers are astonishingly rare. A study surveying mining accidents from 1988 to 1997 found just 14 fatalities related to rollovers, and in every single case, the victim was either thrown from the vehicle, asphyxiated, or drowned. Not one was found inside the cab with a fractured skull. Despite the sample years being less than a decade, the survey cited an astonishing number of bulldozer accidents, and in almost every single case of death by head trauma, the deceased had neglected to wear their seatbelt. Police argued that Bob hadn't been wearing his seatbelt when his body was found, but to his widow, this was further evidence that he had been murdered. She stated that her husband was extremely safety conscious, and would never have gotten to a bulldozer without following the proper protocols. Once Dr. Combs had obtained a copy of Bob's autopsy report, he was able to more accurately articulate why his death was so suspicious. The first and perhaps the most compelling of Dr. Combs' points was that several bones in Bob's hands were broken. To him, these were textbook defensive injuries, wounds which had been sustained as he attempted to defend himself from his mysterious attackers. There were also lacerations to Bob's head, and Dr. Combs stated that if he was present in the cab during its fall, the source of these wounds should have been obvious. The doctor also pointed out that the ribs on both sides of Bob's torso were broken, wounds which couldn't possibly have been caused by a single impact or crash. If the bulldozer rolled down the hill and Bob wasn't strapped into the seat, then his body would have almost certainly been tossed around like a rag doll. But the lack of damage to the roof of the dozer's cab suggested that no such rolling had occurred. Another piece of evidence that Giovanna's attorney found extremely suspicious is the bloodstain identified beside the bulldozer. Photographs of the bloodstain were published by the St. Louis Riverfront Times, so it's not like it was some overlooked piece of evidence. Yet despite the sizable amount of blood present outside the bulldozer, police refused to entertain the idea that a murder had taken place. 
They claim that the blood could have simply dripped out of the bulldozer's broken cab, an opinion which totally contradicted the angle that Bob's body was lying in when it was discovered. Giovanna Casilli has also mentioned how her husband exhibited strange behavior prior to his death. The weekend before her husband died, Giovanna was visiting some friends over in California, so it was down to Bob to pick up their kids from her parents' place. When Bob failed to show up on time, a deeply concerned Giovanna attempted to contact her husband, as his no-show was completely out of character for him. Giovanna then got in touch with one of their neighbors and asked them to drive over to Cementland to see if her husband was there. When this neighbor arrived at Cementland, they reported back to Giovanna that they did not hear anything and assumed the place was derelict since the gate was padlocked. Many have assumed that Bob's failure to pick up his kid was the result of his accident, and by the time the neighbor arrived at Cementland, he was already dead. But Giovanna has pointed out that Bob never locked the gate when he was there working, something which his co-workers attested to as it was in line with the safety regulations Bob so rigorously followed. Another event that seems to have been completely overlooked by police is the fact that Bob was subjected to a violent assault in the weeks before his death. The attack occurred when Bob was working alone in the park and involved masked men who stole power tools after ambushing and incapacitating him. Bob failed to report the attack to police, claiming there was little point, as the tools were unlikely to be recovered by an already overstretched police department. The police ruled that Bob's death was unrelated to the violent robbery and dismissed Giovanna's suggestion that the same group were responsible for her husband's murder. But the dismissal did nothing to dampen the widow's beliefs that Bob's death was the result of foul play. As the investigation floundered, some began to suggest that the people responsible for Bob's death were the ones with the most to gain from it. Following this line of thinking, the eye of suspicion was cast at Bob's former business partner, David Jump. Bob and David each had a 50% share of the St. Louis City Museum, the highly popular tourist attraction that had made them both very wealthy. But upon Bob's passing, David was suddenly the sole recipient of the museum's profits. It's been reported that David paid a generous out-of-court settlement to Bob's family to prevent them from contesting his full, unrestricted ownership of the museum, and relations between the two parties appear to be amicable enough. But it remains a fact that David Jump had a lot to gain from Bob succumbing to a little accident and the possibility of his involvement in his partner's death cannot be ruled out. Despite such an obvious possibility, the St. Louis Police Department appear to have never considered Jump as a suspect, but this appears to be the tip of the iceberg in terms of the department's shortcomings. Numerous news articles purport that over the past decade, St. Louis law enforcement has come under fire for perceived incompetence and apathy as well as the controversial way in handling the 2014 Ferguson riots. If we accuse them of mishandling Bob Casilli's murder, it wouldn't be the first time the St. Louis Police Department had been charged with bungling a serious investigation. Not only does Giovanna Casilli truly believe that her husband was murdered, but it also seems that a very compelling argument can be made to support her suspicions. Casilli's eldest son, Max, is insistent that his father's death was merely a tragic accident, and both he and his sister, Daisy, seem to have made peace with their father's passing. They prefer to reflect on their father's accomplishments in life rather than the event which ended it. If Casilli's death was indeed the result of foul play, his killers did an excellent job of concealing the evidence of their involvement and have kept their secret over a decade later. The fact remains that there is no one left to say exactly what happened that day except for Bob Casilli himself, yet no number of answers could ever bring him back. In 2005, Christopher Vaughn, his wife Kimberly, and their three children packed up their lives in Seattle and drove east to begin a new life in Illinois. Chris had been offered a job at Navigant Consulting's Computer Forensics Group, and since the new role's salary dwarfed what he was making with his own licensed private detective agency, the decision was a no-brainer. For the two years that followed the move, Chris and Kimberly led peaceful and happy lives, the very definition of a prosperous suburban family. 
but on the morning of June 14, 2007, their world was shattered by an event that has paralyzed true crime aficionados for the better part of 15 years. During the week beginning of June 11, 2005, Chris announced that the family would be visiting a water park over in Springfield on the coming Thursday. His children, 12-year-old Abigail, 11-year-old Cassandra, and 8-year-old Blake, were ecstatic at the news and were unconcerned by the idea of getting up at dawn in order to enjoy a fun-filled day at the amusement park. So, on the day in question, the Vaughns departed their home in Oswego and began the three-hour drive down to Springfield. However, less than an hour into their journey, the Vaughns' car ended up at the side of the road, and at around 5.15 a.m., a passing motorist noticed something rather disturbing. Chris Vaughn was limping away from his vehicle, blood dripping down his leg, and when the passing driver asked him what had happened, Chris claimed that he had been shot twice, once through the leg and once through the wrist. Then, when the motorist asked who shot him, Chris simply replied, I think my wife shot me. After the police and ambulance arrived, Chris was taken to the hospital while uniformed officers surveyed the scene. The three Vaughn children were lying on the back seat of the car, each of them having sustained two fatal gunshot wounds, while Kimberly was slumped over the center console with a single bullet hole under her chin. At her feet lay a 9mm pistol, one later determined to be registered in her husband's name. While being treated at a nearby hospital, Chris appeared to be in a deep state of shock and said things which suggested that he had no idea that his wife and children had been murdered. Police officers were forced to postpone questioning until Chris was in a stable and lucid condition. But when he was finally interviewed, he told a truly nightmarish story. Chris told the officers that about 45 minutes into their drive to the water park, Kimberly had mentioned feeling nauseous before asking him to pull over. Chris added that the nausea was a symptom of his wife's migraines, and that she was taking the medications nortriptyline and Topamax to treat them. After pulling over to the side of the road, Kimberly remained in her seat while Chris got out of his car to get some fresh air. It was then he noticed that one of the straps of his car topper was a little loose, so after tightening the strap, Chris climbed back in the driver's seat. Yet just as he sat down, he noticed that his leg was bleeding. After that, his memory of the event grew foggy, and he told officers that he had no memory of being shot at or wounded. In a subsequent interview, when asked if he believed it possible that Kimberly was the shooter, Chris stated that was impossible. There's no way she could have hurt the kids, he reportedly said, before adding that she didn't own a firearm. To some, it might seem like Kimberly had shot her husband and children before turning the gun on herself, and that the gaps in Chris's memory were a trauma-induced reaction to the horror of what he'd witnessed. But to the police, Chris's story didn't wash, and they believed that he was trying to cover up that he was the one who pulled the trigger. To his horror, Chris was arrested a few months after getting out of the hospital, and after a lengthy period of detention, was charged with four counts of first-degree murder. The news was met with horror by the local community, who couldn't believe that such a wholesome-looking man could be capable of such a monstrosity. Public opinion was also flavored by Chris's story that his wife was responsible for their family's destruction, and that his treatment at the hands of police officers was a blatant miscarriage of justice. Yet when he finally was brought to trial in 2012, the prosecution painted a very different portrait of Christopher Vaughn. The prosecution started off by arguing that Chris's version of events did not match the forensic evidence found within the vehicle, and that his wounds showed signs of being self-inflicted. They claimed his apparent amnesia was all a well-thought-out act, one intended to disguise his own guilt, and that an extensive investigation had uncovered a very probable motive. Prosecuting attorneys claimed that Chris had been researching survival methods and had looked up remote places to camp in the Canadian wilderness. They argued that this was either a way of escaping justice after murdering his family, or that Chris harbored some bizarre, self-destructive desire to start his life over as some kind of introverted survivalist. Police had also discovered that Chris had been in email contact with someone and had asked them to help in faking his own death. However, 
This piece of evidence was also used by the prosecution, as the conversation included Chris insisting that his death be faked in a way that allowed his wife to collect on his life insurance. It was a scheme that stood in stark contrast of what Chris was accused of, yet the prosecution produced even more damning evidence over the course of his trial. Investigators had discovered that Chris had visited a number of different strip clubs and had reportedly spent just less than $5,000 on exotic dancers in the week before his family was murdered. Two of these dancers took the stand in Chris's trial, with one stating that he'd repeatedly told her of his desires to leave his wife before moving to Canada to live in the woods. Another told the court that Chris claimed to be single and without children, evidence enough that he had had designs to abandon his family. Chris's defense tied their argument into his original story, arguing that Kimberly's medication was known to cause thoughts of taking her own life and had side effects which included intense confusion or agitation. The defense also stated that Chris had recently spoken with his wife regarding the issue of their marriage, and it was possible that she was so distraught that she decided to annihilate her own family. The argument was a compelling one, but it didn't convince the jury, who returned a verdict of guilty after several hours of deliberation. It was a decision that stunned Chris's close family and friends, who were reeling by the time the judge sentenced him to four consecutive life sentences. Chris immediately appealed the conviction and enlisted the help of an expert crime scene investigator by the name of Robert Deal. Deal had personally worked on the case at one stage and asserted that the investigation into the Vaughn family deaths had been completely mishandled. He stated that there was plenty of forensic evidence to indicate that Kimberly was the shooter, and that at the very minimum, the trajectory of the bullets rolled out any possibility that Chris fired the pistol from the driver's seat. This is a crucial part of the prosecution's argument. Chris had to have been sitting in the driver's seat if he was able to place the muzzle of his pistol under his wife's chin. If he wanted to make it look like she had taken her own life, there had to be powder burns on her chin to trick investigators into believing the wound was self-inflicted. If Chris wasn't in the driver's seat when the bullets were fired, it cast doubt on the prosecution's version of events, and enough doubt might be enough to force a retrial. Robert Deal also leveled heavy criticism at the homicide detectives who worked with him on the case. I felt as if though I wasn't being listened to, he said. Every time I offered up something that was contrary to their theory, they had some reason why I didn't know what I was talking about. Deal was insulted, and rightfully so, as he was an experienced investigator during the time of the murders. He also complained that the homicide detective seemed overly fixated on the prospect of Chris being the killer, and seemed unwilling to even contemplate the idea that a mother had murdered her own children. In their eyes, it also fell back on that Christopher Vaughn, Deal said, they thought he was some kind of criminal mastermind who knew all about crime scenes, and that he was trying to fool me into thinking that something else happened. But Robert Deal was no amateur, and he has vehemently denied having misinterpreted the forensic evidence. The detectives kept changing, trying to make the evidence fit their theory, Deal added, instead of letting the evidence dictate to you the events that occurred. In great detail, Robert Deal explained why it was in fact the prosecution that had misinterpreted the evidence. The state's attorney had Christopher unbuckle his wife's seatbelt before he shot her, when in reality, a large blood stain was found at the point where the latch came together. Since the blood belonged to Chris, this would mean that Kimberly had unbuckled the seatbelt after Christopher was shot, at which point throws serious doubt on the prosecution's case. Following Chris's conviction, an email had come to light which seems to back up the idea that Kimberly's medication was having some horribly adverse effects on her. The email, which was composed by Kimberly herself, states that she was experiencing a huge upsurge of anxiety in the weeks before her death. This could well be down to the amount of nortriptyline that she was taking, as during her autopsy, it was discovered that she had toxic levels of it in her system. Chris's defense lawyers have since cited an FDA study which reports that people taking nortriptyline are at a statistically significant risk of taking their own lives, and that a clinical psychiatrist believed it entirely possible that Chris had been suffering from disassociative amnesia brought on by witnessing a traumatic event. 
Such compelling evidence of wrongful conviction has since spurred the conviction advocacy group Investigating Innocence to champion Chris's cause, and a crowdfunding campaign has raised a sizable amount to fund his legal expenses. If indeed the defense has as compelling an argument as they claim, there's a very real possibility that Chris Vaughn's conviction is soon to be overturned. At the very minimum, he'll be granted a retrial, but doing so will no doubt dredge up some very painful questions for all concerned. What was it that destroyed the Vaughn family? Was it the selfish destructiveness of a neglectful father? Or was it the hellish fury of a woman scorned? Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much friends. And remember to play some Minecraft and go to bed.